The signal goes in there and just, just flies through it. This presentation, actually I'm borrowing it from very, like, uh, Jerry Verduff, he did it uh, back for Denver for us. Um, we also had a club there, Denver Radio Club, we would meet once a month and do about an hour presentation each meeting. Uh, so we, we kind of did a lot. But this is going to go through some of the basics. So I'm going to go through, I don't want to clear every chart, but we'll, you know, talk about it. So, you know, the basics are... We know the sun influences radio propagation, okay? Um, and that's beyond what they call ground wave and line of sight. So people know what ground wave and line of sight are. Basically, your HT is line of sight. If you can see the antenna, you can talk to it. If you can't see the antenna, you can't talk to it. Usually that's how it works. Ground wave are signals that travel along the ground, um, especially great on the ocean. You can go hundreds of miles on the ocean with very little power because you have that nice salt air and salt water and flat surface. So those are the two two biggies. Ground wave also works, you know, on the ground as well, not just water. Uh, and as we know, or you may know, conditions vary during the day. Um, certain things happen. They call on the um, on the, the the gray line. You'll hear that term every now and then, and that means it's right before sunset and night or right before uh, night and sunrise. There's this gray line and usually as you would expect something like that it works vertically. So it works from North America to South America or maybe North America to South Pacific. So it works in that line. It's not going to work to Europe but it's going to work vertically because you guys are running right where the, the uh, propagation layers are starting to fall apart because the sun's coming up or they're starting to be created because the sun's going down. Uh, reflection, that occurs at boundary points. So um, we'll talk about that. I have some examples of that. And that radio waves are reflected by mountains, by suns, by vehicles, by trees, by buildings, everything else you can, you can imagine. Um, and also affected by temperature and moisture content. So sometimes a nice rainy day, you get better coverage than you will on a, on a dry day. Um, again, some radio energy is absorbed by the medium it goes through. So um, when you go through a layer, uh, not all of it gets brought back down again. Some of it disappears in outer space. So you're going to be dealing with that type of thing. Um, refraction is really what's happening when you when you're dealing with HF frequencies and you're dealing with the ionosphere. You're not reflecting, you're refracting. It goes up and then it curves and comes back down again. And I'll show you an example of that. Uh, bending occurs when the waves hit different speeds. So different things absorb and, refl and refract at different speeds. Uh, just like if you look at a light going into water, like a glass of water, sometimes you'll see the light bend. That is, uh, that's bending. And the amount of bending increases at higher frequencies. So you've got to take that into consideration. Uh, speed of waves through the atmosphere change. Again, density, ionization, and HF bands depend upon refraction. Uh, VHF, UHF, line of sight, or ground wave possibly, but HF is all about refraction. And I guess we can, we can see this. Uh, so basically, this is this is what they're talking about refraction. You have a station here. Actually, I can do it this way. Come on. Well, uh, hitting the wrong button. <laughs> there it is. That's the red button. No, it's <laughs> not right <laughs> enough. Um, so basically, your station's on the left, and your actual path's on the right. Uh, if the bath, if the wave wasn't bent, uh, yeah, you'd have that sky wave going up, hitting the atmosphere, and it curves <coughs> and bends back down again. Uh, if that ionosphere wasn't there, it would just keep going out into space. So you can talk to a space. 
that's why a lot of the communications with the shuttles and the space station are all VHF, UHF, or higher band HF, like, you know, six, six meters. Because anything more than that is going to refract back down again, you're never going to hit it. So that's why most of the stuff is that way. The ionosphere affects frequencies below 30 megahertz, so basically everything below 6 meters, everything lower than 6 meters. Um, so, you know, basically in our case, it's from uh, 28 down, 10 meters down. Uh, 30 to 260 miles above the Earth's surface is where the ionosphere sits. Uh, it contains free ions and electrons, so there is some electrical, uh, electromagnetic uh, work that's going on there with taking those frequencies and bouncing them back down again. And again, it, it, it's very key with the ultraviolet radiation, and that's why they talk about sunspot cycles and solar cycles having an effect on communications. So uh, I missed the last really big one because I didn't get my license till after it, and they've been kind of dud since pretty much. This, this one really was, and we're hoping they're not going into a dry spell. Um, skip distances. Now, then we said that you refract. So your, your signal goes up in the air, and it bends on the ionosphere, and it comes down, and it hits Earth, or it hits the ocean. What's it do? It bends and refracts back up again and it bounces and comes back down again. And uh, just to throw something out there, every time it refracts, it changes polarization. So if you have a dipole antenna, you're going up horizontal, it hits the ionosphere, it changes the vertical, it comes back down again, hits the earth, refracts back horizontal, goes back up again, and so on. And that's why HF isn't as critical to how you have your antenna as it is with VHF and UHF, mainly because we're dealing line of sight and we're dealing with a uh, with a repeater sight, which is usually vertical. Um, skip distances depend upon the frequency. You'll hear a term called maximum usable frequency (MUF). I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then there are several layers of varying distances and varying heights. So again, it depends which section of the ionosphere you're dealing with because different ones deal with different frequencies. So the further up you go, obviously the longer your shot's going to be. Uh, so here are the layers. And basically the ones we care about are D, E, F1, F2. And the lowest is obviously the D layer. It's about 50 miles up. And it acts like an RF sponge. It just sucks in your RF. So during daylight hour, it basically di uh, dictates the um, LUF, which is the lowest usable frequency, as opposed to the MUF, which is the maximum usable frequency. The E layer is about 70 miles. Um, it only is there during the daylight hours. When the sun stops heating the ionosphere, the E layer goes away. So it isn't useful, at, at, it isn't there at night, it's only there during the day. Same thing with the F layer. During the day, there are two of them, F1 and F2. At night, there's just one, F. And that's anywhere from 90 to 250 miles up. And then the F1 uh, is not as important to propagation uh, in the medium bands. Uh, the F2 region is, is really primarily what supports HF communications. And at night, they combine into one layer. So that's why at night, sometimes your reception is a lot better than it is during the day. Uh, for those who've listened to um, AM broadcast years ago, I used to listen, I used to pick up, other than New York City, used to pick up stations in the Midwest, those Class A clear channel stations. Yeah, I'd pick up the ones from um, Chicago, yeah. Chicago or Salt Lake. Yeah. Nebraska. Nebraska. All over. Yeah. I used to get QSL cards, too. They used to have them. <laughs> uh -huh. Yep. This is uh, kind of a representation. You can see from the Earth, it's up about 50, 75, about 110 is F1, and then 200 miles above is F2, and you can see around there how they separate out during the day, but at night when the sun stops heating them, uh, the F combine into one. 
and a lot of the other ones, the D&E kind of disappear at night. <coughs> so type of propagation. We have ionospheric waves. So that's what we call sky waves. It hits the ionosphere and bounces back down again. So it leaves the antenna at an angle, um, and it goes up at an angle, comes back down, and keeps bouncing back and forth, uh, you know, until it hits a, another antenna and keeps going, but usually you'll pick somebody up. Uh, there's tropospheric waves, and this deals with the radiation that runs closer to the Earth, the troposphere. And this, is, this works for the higher frequencies, like you'll see it's on 10 meters, uh, a lot on 6 meters. You know, people say, wow, 6 meters is open, I got, you know, a thousand miles. You can even get on, if it's good enough, you can even do it on 2 meters. You can talk hundreds of miles on 2 meters. Because what happens is the troposphere sits below the ionosphere, it's just above the Earth, and it's like a duct. So, just like in a house with, air, with your heat. The signal goes in there and just, just flies through it and comes out somewhere else. Uh, you may not hear anything in between. <clears throat> Won't hear you, but at the other end of that duct, they'll hear you. Tropospheric ducting is a real popular uh, thing to do between Hawaii and Southern California. It actually gets up into the UHF bands on really good conditions. Yep. Also for television. Yep. You should, yep. use, it. You should use UHF tropospheric ducting. ducting. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was in on a hot summer day. I yep. Pick up. Yep. Yeah, that's what it takes, those nice hot summer like days. Yep. I've talked to a wire or two here. Does it have to do with the upside down? Yeah. 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 Does the length of your antenna or the build of your antenna have anything to do with that thing? No. No. You uh, just, just, it has to do electron, uh, uh, your efficiency of your antenna okay. is going to have to do with, but as far as, you know, um, yeah, I understand. It's, it's always the bigger antenna, the better it is, yeah. type deal. But if the signal goes out, it'll still go out. Yes, sir. Yeah. The only, the only, the only issue is how far the antenna is, like a dipole, is above the earth. Okay. Otherwise, you get into something <clears throat> called a, um, a near vertical incident antenna, and we'll talk about that some other time. But that doesn't use ground waves. That goes up and it comes down like a cone. <coughs> So we talk about troposphere, we talk about ground waves, which are surface waves. This stuff runs along the surface. It's affected by the surface, so it could be the ocean. Uh, it's usually vertical, vertically polarized, and the absorption increases with frequency. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the distance, because you're going to lose less of that signal as you go along. And of course, like we said, it travels much further over water than it does over land. <coughs> with, um, with the vertically polarized tip, you have a dipole, raise it higher so the elevation pattern is lower? And uh, run ground wave? I don't want to go into that, but basically when you have a vertical, it depends on your uh, incident angle. How, what angle your antenna, trend, your signal comes off the antenna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually vertical tend to be a higher angle, so mm -hmm. there's shorter hops, so there's a bunch of shorter hops. In each hop you're going to lose some of your signal. Uh, a dipole tends to be more of a lower angle, so you get a good shot on the first, and then usually you hit Europe in like two or three shots versus five or six with a vertical. So it kind of, you know, that, that's kind of the difference between them. Uh, but, you know, they, they, people talk about verticals. I've used one, it works well. And then people say a vertical um, operates poorly equally on any frequency. In all directions. In all directions. Yeah, it transmits in all directions equally bad. So, you know, it's good. They work. But they work. Yeah. And that's all I have. And if that's all you can put up, I'm, I'm, running, a, I'm running a long wire, you know, which is pretty much on an angle. It's almost, almost a vertical. And they Whatever nice. works, works. And they hide nicely in a, uh, yeah. in a flagpole. Uh-huh. Yeah, there are people who live with Covenant restrictions. They put them in flagpoles. I know someone ran a vertical next to his house. Uh, a lot of them get one of the better uh, antenna tuners and mount it at the base so they get maximum transfer of power to their antenna. But that's a totally different subject. And we'll talk about, we can talk about antenna tuners some other time. I have presentations on that too. <laughs> All I get steal. 
Um, so the blessings of Skywave, and again, the medium for, for most of us is, is below 30 meters, megahertz. That's where you, 10 meters is where you start getting the Skywave. Um, and the ionosphere refracts a radio wave and returns it back to the Earth. Uh, the maximum usable frequency, and that's a function of how highly ionized the F region is, okay? So the higher ionization, solar spots, solar storms, you get to a point where it's more active, it bounces more signal back. Mm -hmm. And again, the higher, and, and it lets you go higher in the frequency. Um, the lowest usable frequency is a function of the absorption. Below a certain frequency, most of it gets absorbed by the layer and doesn't get refracted back. So that's, that's the two. So you operate within the range. And we'll talk a little bit, because those numbers are kind of published. You can find out what those are. There are a lot of websites that provide that information. Um, and again, it correlates with movements of the sun. Uh, it peaks at noon and then drops back down again. So it kind of, you know, that's why we said kind of that, that shadow period at night tends to be fun. Uh, you know, you can hit some people that are going into night, some people that are going into sunrise. Um, there's a lot of good times to hit. But the main inhibitor is the solar cycle. That determines how active the sun is, how much radiation, ultraviolet radiation, magnetic radiation the sun is throwing out. Uh, solar cycles run about a little more than 10 and a half, almost 11 years in length. Uh, there's a solar maximum in the middle, Solar minimums on the end, and um, during the maximum, it refracts signals up to 40 megahertz. So now you're talking about close to almost close to six meters. Um, at minimum, you're lucky if you can get out at 20 megahertz. Yeah. Okay. So that's you know, um, and we're currently in a downward cycle of 23. Which let's see, is that where we are now? Yeah. Yep. So that's and we're way in the downward cycle at this point. So here's, here's a kind of example of your 100-year cycles. Um, you know, if you look back from 1940, you look at 1960, man, they still talk about that one. And, 19, and even 1980 wasn't bad. But then as you start going, you know, um, you can see uh, we're, we're right at here, so we're, we're right coming down to the low spot. I think they're very optimistic about 2020. I believe it when I see it, because there's there's discussions. There's so many discussions on this because the information is still trying to figure out what it means, and um, we don't know if we're going through a period where actually the solar minimum for decades, where the solar cycle will actually be kind of stunted, like this year was. So we'll have to see. Um, solar radiation, X-rays, ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet. Uh, during solar flares, you have the ultraviolet and the X-ray emissions increase, uh, and they cause HF signal loss. X-ray flares are small, medium, and large, and they're measured in an angstrom range, which is a just a measurement of X-ray uh, of frequency. And we'll talk a little bit about what the numbers mean because you'll be able you can find the numbers at any given <coughs> given time. Um, this is kind of hard to read, but it kind of it's kind of showing the sun and if a flare produces magnetic storms and they take about 20 to 40 hours to reach the Earth. Uh, electromagnetic radiation takes about uh, 83 minutes. So there is a if there is a, a magnetic storm, there are differences on how long it takes. Uh, cosmic rays take about 15 minutes to several hours. So they, they kind of vary on how long it takes something to hit us. And it's kind of neat now because there are some really good satellites that are watching the Earth, uh, watching the sun. They're actually watching the whole sun. So they can see a solar, um, a solar storm on the backside and predict when it's going to come around. And you know, we've been lucky. We haven't hit a major, major flare that hits, the, hits up the Earth. Most of them have been before or after, but at some time one's going to hit and it's going to make a mess of things. Um, okay, so now we have the solar indexes. So the big number is the flux, and that's a measurement of the radiation, solar noise. 
and it's emitted at about 2.8 uh, gigahertz or 2800 megahertz. Um, the SFU it equates to, to ionization in the F2 layer during the day because remember since it's based on the sun it's only going to happen during the day when the sun is facing where we are and where we care about. So it's a good indication of the HF conditions. Remember we said F2 is really the primary layer that we use during the day. Um, and the, run, and the, the, the units run from about 50 to a high as 300. So low values indicate a low maximum usable frequency. So a low number means that the MUF is going to be maybe uh, 20 megahertz, somewhere in that range. A high value is going to indicate maybe 30 megahertz, higher, you know, 10 meters versus 20 meters. Um, smooth and sun, and there's a sunset, sunspot number. And this is a smoothed number, which means they kind of average how the sun has been going over a period of time. Usually it's a couple of, usually it's months. Uh, and it talks about the amount of sunspot activity, the level of activity. Has the sun been pretty quiet? Has the sun been pretty active? So it's calculated using six months of data before and six months of data after the desired month. Now I always wonder, how do they find out what the six months are going to be like going forward? And basically they just uh, interpolate it based on what it's been like the previous six months and where we are in the cycle. So they kind of can say, okay, way we are, we're kind of coming down on the cycle, it's probably going to get worse, so probably the next six months aren't going to be as good as the last six months. So they come up with that number. And this varies from 0 to 200, with obviously an average of 100 at maximum. Um, high sunspot, sunspot numbers are best for HF propagation, and low sunset numbers are best for low frequency propagation. So, you know, 160 the lower bands. Or if you're into the real low stuff that we have access to now, that's the place to use it. So here's just a picture of a sunspot. Uh, there's some, this was taken, NSO Sacramento Peak Vacuum Tower Telescope. But the one to look at now is just the, uh, the solars and the other satellites have fantastic pictures. And that's all on the NASA website. <clears throat> so now we have, so we talked about sunspots, now we have coronal mass ejections. So that's usually what comes out of a sunspot. When a sunspot gets very active and the waves come up, the magnetic waves come up and they burst and release all that magnetism and all that flux out into the atmosphere, or actually into space, usually in our direction or near our direction. So you have high particle emissions, protons, alpha particles, and they cause high absorption in the polar regions, which is why you get the aurora borealis or the uh, aurora australis, if you're in the southern hemisphere. Uh, low particle emissions cause magnetic field disturbances, so if they're not too bad, you'll still get some field problems, sporadic E though, which means you'll get that that troposphere kind of effect a little bit, where you'll get the E, e layer open up and you'll get some 50 to 144 megahertz. You can actually talk to, you know, talk on an HT out to Hawaii. You, know, you can get a shot right through. Um, and transequatorial spread F, now this kind of runs along the, the, ge, you know, the geomagnetic equator, so it doesn't affect us too much, but it allows for long distance communications that are equidistant from the, from the equator. So basically, if um, it wouldn't work down to Hawaii unless you were on the same latitude as Hawaii. So this is basically communications across the same latitude, the same equidistance from the equator. And again, this is a result of intensified F2 layer, which is high sunspot activity. And um, actually, signals have a rough aurora-like note. They kind of go in and out, and they kind of make some weird sounds. So you can definitely tell you're, you're doing it. Um, 
this is a little important because you start seeing these numbers. So there are national, natural variations in the geomagnetic field, and that's what our signals are, is electromagnetic. So we wind up with a K index, which is basically, it's a three hourly range magnetic activity. So you're looking at, um, and again, it says, it says quasi-logarithmic because it kind of goes up on a on an angle, like a 90 degree angle. Or no, sorry, 45 degree angle. So it, it ranges with the activity, um, and it's a, you know, it's assume, they assume a quiet day curve, so the K index could be good or bad, and I'll talk about what numbers mean. And then there's an A index, which is daily average of the K index. So K index is what's happening now over an hour, three hour range, and the A index is what's happened over the last day. So an A index below 15 and a K index at or below 3 is good for propagation. So kind of that's kind of good to know and you can see what the K's and A's are. There are even websites that will put it at the bottom of your browser, little apps that will do that. But it basically, the key is the lower the number, the better it is for, for, eight, you know, for uh, talking, for DXing. And here's kind of a good example. So obviously A is the best because the, the noise is low and you're not going to have a lot, of, uh, a lot of atmospheric noise. That's the key. As you get higher in the A's and higher in the K's, you talk about unsettled, active, minor storms, severe storms, and very major storms. And again, this is solar activity and its impact on our ionosphere, on the Earth. And HF band prediction characteristic, 80 and 40 meters are good bands for distance communication, especially <coughs> from the sunspot medium. So they're kind of in that middle there, they're not really low there. So that's, you know, you're talking about 7 megahertz to um, 20, uh, 40 is uh, 30, no, 14. 14. No, it's 20. 3.5 3. to 7. 3.5 to 7. There you go. Thank you. Uh, 30 meters is greater than 40 at night. Again, the ionosphere cools down and the F layers converge. Uh, 20 meters is very popular, very popular during the day, but it closes down at night, especially during the winter and sunspot minimum. So you'll hear 20 meters is real active during the day. At night, it gets dead. Uh, and, and in return, 30 and 40 <coughs> meters pick up during the night time. It, it just hit me. This is why there's so many retirees on the air. Yeah. <laughs> it's during the day. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> no. <laughs> so those the day. But again, but again <laughs> remember <laughs> that the sun is moving. Right. So different places are going to be during the day and at night. So... You know that's why things like Echo Link and IRP are so nice because they're they're irrelevant of the of the ionosphere. You're talking just local, so it's kind of fun to do that. Uh, 15 meters, which is pretty high frequency uh, during sunspot activity minimum. A uh, few stations are heard. Um, you need good sunspot activity to get those higher frequencies. 10 meters, same same thing. Um, the low absorption allows good communications with relatively low power during daylight. I find sometimes in discussing this, and you're talking, you're using meters. Yeah. 10 meters, 30 meters. Mm -hmm. And yet, many of our, our young troops are, are new into the field, and then I realize that 30 meters is actually 10 megs, and 10 meters is actually. Almost 30 minutes. <laughs> so they're going to get all backwards. So. Yeah, yeah. The, as the meters go up, the fre as the meters go down, the frequency goes up because the meters are the function of the wavelength. Mm -hmm. So you know when you're dealing with two meters, 144 megahertz is two meters. I just divide by 300, and hopefully it's close. <laughs> yep. And it makes it easy because most radios these days, when you hit the end of the band, won't let you transmit. But you've got to be careful if you're doing upper sideband and you get too close to that, that end, you could be operating 
out of band. That's actually yeah, the other way around. That's, <laughs> on <the> <laughs> 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 that's that's basically it. There's a lot of stuff on the web. ARRL has a propagation page. Uh, NOAA has propagation. Uh, there's a QRZ solar report. There's uh, EHAM, DS, <coughs> solar terrestrial. I'll give the charts to to uh, Jason, and he can post them. And you guys know we have a, a Facebook page too. I'm not doing it there, but just saying, you know, we're starting to use it more. So. So we do these things on the old time. Yeah. So, but that's basically it. That's, that's good. I kind of rattled through that about half an hour. Any other questions on that? I know it's kind of. I try not to get too deep into it, but it, uh, it's kind of interesting stuff, and if it sparks your interest, there's a lot of stuff out there on it. You can find it on the internet. And again, if nothing else, go look at the NOAA website and look at the solar satellites. It is so interesting to see some of the pictures they have uh, from those, um, and the fact that they actually can see around the back of the sun so they can project when solar storms are coming around. And that's really neat. That suggests there's a satellite on the other side of the sun. <coughs> what was that? That suggests there's a satellite on the other side of the sun. Yes. There, there, there is? Yes. That's, a, that's crazy. Um, well, we go on the other side of the sun. It just, they're, yeah. they're geostationary around the sun. So, I mean, they made it there and it just stays there. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Actually, there's, there's two. They're kind of, uh, one just, on one side, one of them is three satellites. So they pick up, he picks up a little more than a third. But it's really slick to look at those, those pictures. Yeah. Yeah, the, last, the last ones were the, were the latest. I have a quick question. Sure. So I heard this recently, but I would like to hear it from you. Do it again? Oh, uh, no. Um, what happened to layer A, B, and C? Now, I heard something, so I'm just curious if anyone's heard the same. They don't live. They, I don't think they really exist. So the, they, they, the, the founding fathers of RF decided to start at D because they weren't sure what they're going to come up with. Yeah. So they started at D because they weren't sure if they were going to become smarter in the future and find and C, B, and A C. closer to the earth. Yeah. So that's why the lowest one starts at D. It was a burning question for me. <laughs>